So the story about the Ken Oferata matter of what happened in Parliament today uh, is to be summarized as in, in a little uh, narrative here that we can all understand. So the Constitution, in expression of separation of powers, actually checks and balances, uh, permits the Legislative Assembly to have some checks over the executive arm of government. One of those expressions, one of the expressions or the manifestations of such checks uh, outlined in the Constitution is that Parliament should, by um, an overwhelming majority, be able to censure a minister, um, never mind the fact that a minister has been appointed by the President under Article 78 and has passed Parliament Appointment Committee hearings and has been duly sworn in as a Minister of State. Once the Minister of State is sworn in, Parliament can decide that the minister has done something that constitutes a violation of the oath of office that he took. Because when ministers take the oath, they are expected to abide by the contents of the oath they take, and they are expected generally to be of good behavior as leaders of the society. Therefore, the Constitution permits Parliament, in certain circumstances, to be able to bring a censure motion against the minister. All we have known about this censure motion, which has been in the Constitution for 32 years and never really been applied in such significant manner as it has been on this occasion, is that the censure motion, when it's moved, must carry two-thirds support in Parliament because we have never had a political party winning two-thirds of uh, the seats in Parliament. Hopefully, we will not get that in any time soon because that then creates a very uh, 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 rabid uh, uh, one-party kind of situation. So we really don't want that. But the framers of the Constitution anticipated that we might not be able to get that. And so they made the essential for minister to be two-thirds because it has to be something very, very important. And the overwhelming uh, number, numbers of the members of Parliament must agree with it uh, before a minister is removed. The, the Constitution makes it difficult to remove a minister if you are not the president. The president can remove a minister, a minister because he appoints them. The Constitution allows the People's Representative Parliament to also remove a minister through the censure motion. But that is very difficult because you need two-thirds. Okay. So this censure motion was tabled, and this is the uh, censure motion in the history of the Fourth Republic that has gone very far in terms of the process from the beginning, the debate, the committee, all the way to the voting which occurred today, which on, uh, uh, fortunately for the MPP and unfortunately for the NDC, uh, the votes failed to, um, to, to ground the censure motion against Ken Oferata. Let me come back to the screen and describe uh, what we see. Alban Sumanu Kingsford Bagbin is the uh, Speaker of Parliament and he was uh, chairing the debate today. Godfrey Diabo Adam is not a member of parliament. He's the Attorney General, Minister for Justice. He was invited to parliament to deliver a legal opinion on the matter of censure because as far as Bagbin is concerned, and many constitutional watchers have agreed with him, that because we do not have a certain procedure to flesh out the censure motion, he wanted to use this opportunity to create a procedure. So the procedure he created was as follows. A censure motion is, is uh, brought before the House, supported by the minimum number of people who need to do so because that's also a requirement, both under the Constitution and understanding orders of Parliament. So that was, that was brought to the House. Then he allowed, he set up a committee, uh, Speaker Bagman set up a committee to look at the matter. And the committee had Katie Hammond and Dominic Haini as co-chairs. I'm mentioning the committee because Godfrey Dami's um, opinion has a lot to say about the committee and, and Dominic Haini's role. So I'm, I'm just laying that foundation. So there was a committee. The committee then decided that they needed to invite the minister against whom the censure motion had been issued. And so Ken Oferata was invited to the committee to take questions from the committee. Then the committee finished this work. And then the committee is then, as, a, as an ad hoc committee of parliament, same as a select committee of parliament, they are supposed to put their work together and then bring it to the plenary. That's what usually happens. The plenary, which is all the members of the House put together, would, however, take their decision based on the signal they get from the committee. So when the committee comes to the, the plenary and says that we have unanimously approved uh, uh, Paul Adamotri as the captain of the Black Stars, that decision will be endorsed by the... Uh, by, the, by the, the parliament, most likely the plenary will endorse it because the committee said it was a unanimous decision. If, however, the committee is divided on the matter and they bring their report to the House and say that we are not too sure about Paul Adomochi as captain of the Black Stars, what then happens is that the, the matter in issue is put before the plenary for a vote, most likely for a secret ballot vote to determine what has happened. So this is the procedure so far at the Senator motion. So the committees did its work. Oferata appeared before the committee. And today, this morning, the motion, uh, the committee's report was laid before the House. In their report, the committee merely said, gave the answers that Oferata gave in uh, uh, sort of defending himself. 
they gave the answers that Ofuata gave in defending himself when he appeared before the committee. So, Godfrey Dami issued an, an opinion, and we're going to show you that in a minute. So now, this is, this, uh, this is how uh, uh, we, are, we are focusing on the Attorney General's intervention in Parliament today. How did the Attorney General intervene? What did he say about the motion before the vote was taken? And of course, we know that the majority and NPP walked out on the, on the vote. They said they were not participating. They said a lot of uh, the, the ingredients that went into the decision of the majority was uh, laid out by... Um, by the Attorney General. And so this is what he said. So let's look at it now. It says the motion on the vote of censure against the Honorable Minister of Finance, uh, conduct of proceedings by the ad hoc committee uh, by the Attorney General Godfrey de Boadame. Now, in the first paragraph that I'm going to read to you, he sets out the basis on which he was invited or the basis on which he must have an opinion on this matter. It says, in furtherance of the role of the Attorney General as principal legal advisor to the government and his constitutional designation as a defendant in all civil proceedings against the state, which includes Parliament, I, the Attorney General, find it necessary to express a view on certain developments at the proceedings of the committee, which have been quite alarming to me. And so when, when Godfrey Dami started his presentation this way, that the proceedings of the committee had been alarming to him, it generated a lot of interest from the press gallery. And in the morning, if you were, you were on the platform, you see people texting each other, say, hey, listen to what's happening in Parliament. Attorney General says something was alarming to him. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. So a lot of interest is generated from this point onwards. He says, the standing orders of parliament in point of fact empower parliament to seek the assistance of the attorney general on matters of law including the conduct of proceedings as the ad hoc committee is involved so he's sort of grounding the basis on which he's in there all right let's move on and see what else what else he says okay uh come back to the next one please okay yes so now we have set out the questions that he answered so the first question uh sorry let's come back yeah the first question he answered is whether or not the procedure of setting up a committee was quasi-judicial in nature. Now, there was a, a conversation that uh, people were making the point that Oferata has to be heard, that Ken Oferata must be heard on the matter. And the issue was, is it a judicial hearing? Is it a quasi-judicial hearing? Are his rights being trampled upon? So that was a matter that was discussed. And the committee was expected to, to uh, ventilate that issue. And I believe they ventilated it in the affirmative. And that's why they invited Oferata to come there. But let's hear what the Attorney General said about it. He said, it was with great consternation that I had a co-chairman of the committee, Dr. Dominic Ayini, Dominic Ayini himself, a former Deputy Attorney General, suggest at the hearing, which was broadcast live on television, that the exercise undertaken by the committee was not a quasi-judicial process and that it was engaged in a constitutional political process, quote and unquote, quote, constitutional political process. Clearly, the Attorney General says, the reference by Mr. Speaker of the motion to a committee set up under Order 106 was in recognition of the fact that the process for a vote of censure on a minister was quasi-judicial and therefore warranted the full grant of the right to a fair hearing and other constitutional privileges consistent with due process. It was, therefore, fundamentally erroneous and bad in law for the co-chair to assert that the committee was not engaged in a quasi-judicial proceedings, but rather some amorphous constitutional political process. So that was the first blow that Godfrey Dami threw. He said that. From watching the, observe, observing the process, the entire thing is shrouded in some illegality because the committee is quasi-judicial. Yes, he said he heard uh, Dr. Dominic Aini, my former lecturer, I have to say, and, uh, and the former Deputy Attorney General, who is also a member of Parliament, uh, say at the committee that this was not a quasi-judicial hearing, that it was rather, he used the term, constitutional political process. Well, but it can be constitutional, political, and also quasi-judicial. Because the document of the Constitution, when it prescribes anything, it prescribes it within the context of law, within the context of rights, I should say. The Constitution is big on rights. The Constitution is the, is the fundamental holder of the rights of our people, of all people of Ghana. So you cannot have a constitutional process that undermines any single right, especially the first generation right, which is like a right to be heard, a right to first trial. Those are first generation rights. They are second generation and third generation rights. But these are first generation rights. And so the, a constitutional provision um, detailing a process cannot detail a process 
arising out of the constitution or arising out of parliament or standing orders that undermines the rights of any Ghanaian. So there can be nothing like a constitutional political process that is allowed to undermine the rights of an individual. There, there can be a constitutional political process, yes, but it cannot undermine the rights of an individual because it is called constitutional, political, and it's not called quasi-judicial. I think that the, uh, the, the opinion of many uh, students of politics and law will indicate that a matter arising out of the constitution cannot be seen to obscure the rights of people. Okay, so that was his first point, which, which was uh, uh, widely applauded even, even by people who were watching on, in the press gallery. All right. He continues and says that the error may explain the reluctance of the committee to avail the respondent his rights to the basic requirements of a fair trial, including the provision of particulars of the allegations against him, for him to study and appreciate before attending upon the committee to hear the proponents. There was a confusion about whether the committee should allow Ken to speak or not, and, and Mr. Dami is saying that it is this error of appreciating the context of the work of the committee that if you don't appreciate the context of the work of the committee as quasi-judicial, and you give it some name, whatever name, and you believe that by giving it some name, you can obscure the rights of the individual in question, it is then that when you fall in that trap, you will have the error of, of deciding whether you are inviting Ken Ophirata or not, all of that. Okay, let's move on very quickly to the other things he said. The next question he answered was, whether or not the committee hearing breached the Nemojudes rule against uh, being a judge in your own case. So the, the rule of, of, uh, of, of thumb for trial in these matters is a Latin expression, nemo judes in cosa sua. That is to say, an individual cannot be a judge in his own course. Nemo judes in cosa sua. You cannot be a judge in your own course. Attorney General is alleging that this rule was breached. How was it breached? Let's read. He says, the record shows that a co-chairman of the committee, Dr. Dominic Ayeni, was a proponent of the motion for censor, for censure, in the sense of being one of the members of parliament who petitioned for the removal from office of the Minister for Finance. It is therefore incongruous for the same person, Dr. Aini, as it is, to be appointed to preside over the proceedings consequently initiated. For one to chair proceedings resulting from a petition signed by oneself is the classic manifestation of one being a judge in his own course. Very interesting, isn't it? Very, very interesting. And all of these arguments were made in Parliament this morning. So the, 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 uh, the Attorney General is saying that. Another observation that he's made about the committee is that the rule of Nemojudes, the first trial, was completely violated. Why was it violated? Because it says that Dr. Ayini, who, who moved the, who was part of the sponsor, he was one of those who sponsored the censure motion against Ken Ophirata, himself, was part of the committee and was actually a co-chair of the committee. The only small matter there that I need to check is whether or not Dominic Aini elected himself to be co-chair or that the speaker put him there. It is possible that the speaker put him there. It's also true that even if the speaker put him there, he could have recused himself. Of course, knowing the law, being a former deputy attorney general, being a law lecturer, it's expected that if the speaker put a Dominic Aini, uh, Dr. Aini there, Dr. Aini will be able to say, I don't want to participate in this because I have a position. My position is already known. I am supporting the motion. I'm not some neutral person here to become chair of the committee. I can join the committee, but I don't want to chair. I cannot chair. Something like that is what the attorney general is alleging. The attorney general considered this a very big violation of the entire process of the committee's work and concluded, therefore, that there were some illegalities around the censure motion. Let's go on and see the third issue. The third issue is whether or not parliament can determine issues of conflict of interest of a public servant. Now, and one of the, the cases made against Ken Ophirata is that there was significant conflict of interest in the way in which he did his work. We have had occasion here to talk about that all the time when the KKD issue came up. So the general issue is that Ken Ophirata is founder of Data Bank, and it's the same Data Bank that advises government on borrowing, and whenever government borrows, Data Bank and fees. So that there's a conflict of interest, a clear, well, is it clear? It appears to be clear conflict of interest against Ken. And it was raised in the essential motion by parliament. It, forget, uh, not, never mind that. It was the same parliament that approved the, the loans that Ken Ophirata took. And also did approve all the fees and everything that was paid to everyone. Parliament saw it. Parliament approved it. If Strategic Africa Securities was there, it would be there. If Data Bank was there, it would be there. Fidelity Bank. Parliament had already seen that. However, uh, in the essential motion, parliament said that uh, those who were sponsoring the motion said that Ophirata must be brought up to, for question about conflict of interest. What does Attorney General say? He says as follows. 
It is noted, he said, that the first ground of the motion for censure hinged on an allegation of conflict of interest. Chapter 24 of the Constitution, Articles 284 to 288, is on the conduct of public officers. Article 287 preserves, uh, uh, preserves the determination of whether a public officer has contravened a, con a, a provision of Chapter 24, including conflict of interest or unethical conduct, to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice charge in the famous Okujetua Blakwa number 2, and another versus Attorney General and Obeche Bilamte number 2, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 45845, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 2012845. The Supreme Court actually unanimously declined jurisdiction to deal with an issue of conflict of interest in affirmation of the mandate of Shraj. So the Attorney General is saying something here. He's saying that if you want to investigate conflict of interest, then you have to go to Shraj according to the Constitution and according to a Supreme Court ruling. But here again, Parliament is the representative of the people, and they? They are the representative of the people. So uh, I, I'm not sure why, what criteria that a determination will be made that conflict of interest has arisen or not. But Parliament should be able to have a look at conflict of interest. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing the question. Attorney General says the, the forum, which is correct, the forum for conflict of interest ought to be the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, pursuant to the provisions of Article 287 of the 1992 Constitution. And indeed, supported by his quoting a Supreme Court uh, a decision, you know, Kujetua Blackwa versus another and uh, Obeche Bilamte versus another, it's reported in uh, number two, volume, volume two, it says. 2012 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 845. That's where he's, he's back in it. But I'm just saying that Parliament are the representatives of the people. They are. So that a conflict of interest matter, once there's a criteria to determine the Parliament should be able to make that determination, shouldn't they? I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, so this is what uh, concludes, I don't conclude yet, concludes the things that the Attorney General said today in Parliament, uh, about which he received a lot of applause from the majority and about which the minority were speaking. At some point, the Honorable Harun Idrisu asked the Attorney General to be mindful of the fact that he's Attorney General for the whole country. He's not just Attorney General for MPP government. The Attorney General's response was quite uh, uh, swift, and uh, it was indicated to the Honorable Minority Leader that just this week, the Attorney General had issued an opinion about bonds, and he had told the government that you cannot renegotiate bonds unilaterally with Ghanaians. If you do so, it's illegal and that you owe them. And many Ghanaians cheered the Attorney General for that advice. Many NDC people cheered the Attorney General for that advice. Indeed, uh, um, uh, Adongo, uh, Isaac Adongo, my friend in Parliament, had used that advice from the Attorney General and indicated that it was a very good advice. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Mr. Dami has been in the news uh, for the bonds and now for Parliament and for the Kendall Ferrata issue. I think that we have put out enough so, so we can now uh, ventilate the issues, get on your, your phone and get on Good Evening Ghana Official. What do you think about this Ofuata Senja motion? May I conclude by announcing, even though you know already, that at the end of the, of the situation, the Speaker put the question, the vote was taken, and 136 people uh, in the uh, Parliament voted for the censure motion. Uh, NDC will count themselves as 137, but we know that uh, Asin North is no longer in Parliament, so there will be 136. It would appear, therefore, that the entire uh, membership of Parliament of the National Democratic Congress did move uh, votes for the censure motion, and the entire minority uh, did uh, leave the chamber after the Attorney General had made his presentation and convinced his people that the motion was fraught with a lot of illegality.